Welcome to Theology Thursday, a weekly podcast dedicated to cultivating theological conversations amongst millennials. I am your host, Ryan Mock. And I am your co-host, Connor Grubbs. Ryan, it's great to hear you do the intro again in your own Wilson-esque voice. It's been several wow. weeks. Yeah, it has. It's, it's like there's been three weeks where I just haven't been on the podcast, either because I was sleeping or... I was sleeping, yeah, and I can't remember what the other thing was. I don't know, but it's uh, it's been kind of fun getting to do the intro. There's something really satisfying about it. Yeah, it's just like this is the start of our podcast. Yeah, I've I've, I've enjoyed getting to do that the past couple weeks, but it's also nice nice to have have your voice back doing it because that's what we're used to. That's what the fans want, Ryan. That's right. They want me. Yeah, they want. I mean, they, I am the host. They want Owen Wilson. Um discount Owen Wilson that is that's right so it's just us this week Johnny has uh, his baby has arrived Zoe is here yay um, and she is awesome uh, I got to spend several days with her and she is just the best um, and thankfully she took more after her mother than she did her father uh, meaning she's a beautiful baby girl and we're just we're happy to welcome her to the world uh, it'll probably be a couple weeks till Johnny's able to join, um, and and we're gonna give him that time. Uh, so it's just it, 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 we've had a lot of guests on recently. It's been very interesting, but now uh, we're back. Yeah, this is we're, this is old school theology Thursday. Old school, right the here. OG squad. Yes, right here. Bam. I like it. I like it a lot, and it's gonna be uh, it, it's a good time for you to come back because starting next month. Um, October, October 31st is Reformation Day, Woo-hoo. and so next month, the whole month of Theology Thursday will be dedicated to the Reformation. We're going to talk about it every awesome. week. We're going to talk about the history of it, the theology of it, you know, all the all those fun things about the Reformation. Because me and Ryan are big fans of the Reformation, so maybe maybe this is a good month for Johnny to take a break. He's he's not quite as reformed. I mean, he's basically are. a Catholic, so I mean. Well, <laughs> I I yeah, I wouldn't say that, but okay. Um, so let's get get into some sub points here. Mm. The, the fans love the sub points. Con- Connor, what is your sub point? You want me to go first? Yeah, honestly, you know, ladies first. So. Wow. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, okay, so Lauren Daigle just came up with her new album, Look Up Child. Okay, who, who is that? She is a contemporary worship artist, um, and she she does some contemporary worship songs. Nice. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. I'm not um, necessarily contemporary Christian music savvy, to be honest. I'm not either. Maybe that makes me a bad youth pastor. I don't know. Um, hold on. Um, try, uh, never mind. It doesn't matter. But she she's she's pretty big in contemporary worship and stuff, and that's nice. Um, and I, I do know one song she did. The chorus is like, "I want to seek you first. I nice. want to seek you first." Yeah, that was really good. I don't know that song. Yeah, no, it, it was good. I want to I want to seek you first. That's nice. So she came out with a new album, but the reason this is such a big deal is because it topped not only the Christian music charts but it topped all of the music charts when it came out it wow. beat ariana grande drake Nicki minaj so got a lot of attention um when it came out because it actually beat out a lot of the contemporary artists that have recently come out with new music as well so it's uh interesting to see because we've seen this shift happening in rap yeah, where um, Christians and secular artists collaborating in the rap genre is more common now, and and just talk about religion and God in the rap genre in general is increasingly more and more common and welcome. Yeah, but we haven't so much seen the contemporary genre start to cross over into the world of secular music. So it's it's interesting to see moving forward what does this kind of exposure mean for the contemporary quote unquote Christian music genre. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, definitely there's the gap between Christian rap and secular rap 
is there's not much of a gap. The, the message is obviously different, um, but everybody's more welcome into it. But you know, contemporary Christian music, on the other hand, there's a large gap between contemporary Christian music and secular like pop, pop music, music yeah. just because not only is it a different message, but it just like sounds completely different. Yeah, even even quality wise, a lot quality, of quality. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the only time you get anything close is when the contemporary Christian genre tries to copy uh, the current pop sound, and that never ends well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is definitely an interesting thing to happen, and for the better. Yeah, because I think uh, Lauren Dale is one of the more talented contemporary artists. Uh, she does have a great voice, and, and she writes her own songs, and, and I respect all of that. Um, but it's just interesting, because if you're topping the charts like that, you're definitely going to have some influence um, so it'll be interesting to see where that goes from here because I think that's um, that could very well be the beginning of a sort of shift uh, and a good shift for contemporary Christian music and we'll just have to wait and see. Ryan, what is your sub point? Okay, my sub point, it's not really like a big universal event that happened. It's just something that happened with our youth groups. Last week, we went to go see a movie. The movie is called The Favorite. Mm. This is a Christian movie, so it's not to be mistaken with the other movie called The Favorite, which is like rated R, and it's there's not another Christian. There's another movie there, called The there Favorite? Is an, if you Google The Favorite, there's going to be a movie that pops up, and it is not the movie that we saw. Okay. I, I think I think Connor's doing it right now. Yeah. Keep anyways, going, keep yeah. Okay, so this movie called The Favorite, it's a Christian movie, and I'm pretty sure it's just a local thing. Like, you're not, if you go, if you like live in Colorado, I don't think you're going to be watching this movie, uh, because this, this, this movie takes place in the Tampa area and it's about a local guy the the gist of the story is that this person he's an MMA fighter and so he does like MMA fights because that's what an MMA fighter would do and his brother gets oh they get in a car crash him and his brother and like their girlfriends and this MMA fighter, his name's Benjamin, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. he, I mean, he turns out fine, but his brother, Luke, I think his name was, Luke gets, like, totally messed up, and he has to have a part of his brain removed, and the whole story is basically Benjamin trying to cope with all of this, and he gets mad at his parents because he thinks his parents don't love him, they love Luke more. And it's honestly, in my opinion, it's a really good movie. I mean, it's a really good story. Mm. Um, like, it's not like the greatest movie I've ever seen. Uh, the acting, uh, wasn't, wasn't the best acting. Uh, you definitely do better. Uh, but as far as the story goes, I think this was a great story. Yes, which which I definitely respect because I think, unfortunately, what you get with so many Christian movies is not only is it bad acting, but it's a bad story as well. Yeah. There's just, there's a lot of very low quality Christian films. So the fact that there was some thought put into the script and the, the overall story, um, that I respected that And a the lot. cool thing is that this movie was inspired by true events very loosely if if you watch if you go and watch this movie and you watch till the end you'll you'll see it will kind of explain what the inspiration was but yes it was inspired by true events i want to say yes so um that was nice that was filmed in the area yeah um so, so i rec i recognized some scenes yeah some places i'm like ooh, i know that place there are actually a couple of friends of mine that were were extras in the background. Yeah, I do. Re I do recognize. See, I did see somebody in the background. That I recognize. I'm like, oh, I know that person from somewhere, but I don't really. I don't know where from. I just yeah. like that person looks familiar. Well, it might have been the same lady who han was handing out the tickets because she was Bentley. She was in the background as well. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't even notice that. No, her whole family was in the as extras that went one, one oh. scene. Well, good so, yeah, job. There were a few, few really good scenes. Obviously, things could have been done better. Um, but when you're on a budget, you can't really hire like a professional cast. Right. I so, understand like, that. You just gotta respect that. And I think certainly I've seen movies like this actually help people before. Like okay, so uh, so this they... this harkens back to our very first episode. Oh, Are yeah. Christian movies an effective ministry? That's right. This is this is a good flashback. This is totally like going full on old school theology Thursday. 
Um, but yeah, I think this movie did very well for what it was given. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. There you go. I think that's I think that's a fair assessment. Yes. Um, so that being said, Ryan, uh, we had a topic scheduled for today because I actually I like to plan ahead. I have the next year of topics scheduled. Oh, I'm Connor. I'm prepared. <laughs> but. And by the way, that's not to say you can't ask questions, because if you send in questions, we can totally shift it around. But Ryan actually said, I have something I really want to talk about this week. Uh, I guess a question that somebody had asked you. Yes. So, Ryan, what are what are we talking about today? Okay, so about a week ago, I had a long-distance friend reach out to me. And she messaged me, and she's, she was looking for advice on how to uh, deal with her other friend, uh, who has some questions about God and Christianity. So I'm going to read this, and then we're going to jump right in. Okay, Connor? Okay. Okay, so this person this person asks, Okay, I currently have this friend that is really struggling with the concept of hell and having to do a lot to make it to heaven. He also has this great fear associated with God, seeing him as unloving and wrathful. I've tried to explain to him the necessity of getting to know God by reading the Bible, but he's not confident that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Any advice? So I've already talked with this friend a lot. We've gone back and forth, and a lot of what I'm going to say in this podcast, she's probably already heard me say to her. Um, But I think this question addresses something that a lot of people struggle with, and that is the concept of God uh, being wrathful, but also being loving, mm-hmm. and how does that how does that work? Like, how can God be a God of wrath, and how could God be a God of love? That is an interesting question, and I think a lot of atheists, a lot of skeptics, uh, look at the biblical text and they say that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are two completely different characters. Right. That that is one of the criticisms of the Bible. Like, hey, we look at the Old Testament, we see God as a big bully, and he's a meanie butt, and he just wants (laughs) to punish everybody, and then we see, oh, the the God of the New Testament is just all warm and fuzzy. Right. I just want to give me a big hug. Whereas we teach that God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never changing. So, how does all that add up? Right. Well, just to give you a few Bible verses um, that talk about you know, God's love and God's wrath, you know, let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So this verse is telling us right off the bat, hey, God is love. That is his very being. But then you come to other passages in Scripture, and you're like, what is happening here? I'll read a few for you, for you here. This is 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. This is a story about Elisha, the prophet. He, Elisha, went up from, went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. He was call- the boys were calling him a bald-headed man. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. So, I mean, we have, we have this, this one verse that says, God is love. And then we come to this passage, Second Kings, where these... these these gang of boys are making fun of this prophet, and this prophet curse them, and two bears come out of the woods and devour them. And you're like, what is happening? Here's another example. This is Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unorthor- unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said, Among those who are near me I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And so you see in this story, you see these two dudes, they're the sons of Aaron, they're in charge of like the temple order and stuff like that, and they, they offer up to God 
an unauthorized, unauthorized fire or a strange fire. And this does not please God very much, so he strikes them down. And you're like, what is happening? Like, why did they deserve this? And as Connor mentioned, a lot of critics of Christianity say, hey, the God of the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, but the God of the New Testament is a God of love. But even the New Testament contains stories like this. I'll read you Acts. We're going to chapter 5 here. Ooh, I know where you're going oh, with this. Oh, Connor knows. Don't spoil it, though. This is about Ananias and Sapphira. <sighs> I knew it. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. Okay, so they, they, this, this couple, they sold a piece of property, they get money. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds Ooh. and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Hmm. So he got some money, and he's like, I want to give to the church. But he didn't give all of the money to the church that he earned. He only gave back, he only gave back to the church part of it and didn't tell anybody. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And and, and Peter is saying here is like, this is your property. You didn't have to give everything to us, so why are you lying about why you giving everything to lying. us? All right, be quiet, why Connor. Don't, to... don't even. Okay, fine. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. God just, bam, struck him down. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young man arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. I don't know what that amount was, but it is for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who had buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Mm. Ooh. And I like that it only says so much. I think it kind of reinforces the fact that the amount didn't matter. It was that they lied about it. Yeah, yeah, that, that was the key. It's like God wasn't really too concerned about uh, they didn't give all of their stuff. He was concerned that they lied about giving all their stuff. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. So just reading those stories, what does that tell us about God? That he's uh, going to strike you down dead if you don't give all your money. Ah, no! <laughs> I don't! <laughs> Please. Um, obviously, this tells us that God is the God of wrath. And in the church, in American church, we forget this, or we throw this to the curb. We would much rather talk about a God who makes us feel warm and fuzzy. And, you know, I don't blame you. I, I, want, to, I want to feel warm and fuzzy, too. And God can make us feel warm and fuzzy. God is a God of love, as I read in 1 John 4, uh, verses 7 through 8. But we have to also understand that God is a God of wrath. But how do we combine the two? Where, where, does, the, where, where does the reconciliation occur? In order to do that, I think we need to understand not only who God is, but we have to understand who we are. Hmm. Too, many people, too many people don't understand those things. And so they believe that God owes us grace or God owes us love but if God owes us grace is that really grace no no it's not see it comes from a faulty understanding of who God is and who we are so we're going to talk about that okay all right Connor just stick with me <laughs> don't be afraid so I want to jump to a very famous passage in Isaiah Ooh. You want to you want to give a guess, Connor? Isaiah fifty seven twelve. Connor, <laughs> you were just absolutely wrong. Um, are we are we actually are we going to the call of Elijah? I mean, <laughs> Isaiah. <laughs> 
Yes, we're going to Isaiah, Isaiah 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Oh, Bam. I, I don't know why I said Elijah. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Yeah, well, I, just, I did mention Elisha earlier. Yeah. So that's probably what got you. Okay, so Isaiah 6. Yes. Yeah. This is. Ooh. I. Okay, I see you. All right, let's yeah. do it. So before we can talk about God's wrath, there's another attribute of God that we need to talk about. What do you think that attribute is? His holiness. God is holy. Okay. So we're going to jump right in this text, and I'm going to read it for you here. If you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Okay. Okay, Connor. Okay, I'm going to start reading now. In the year that King Uzziah died... <laughs> Uzziah. You don't want to make fun of... You want to make fun of Uzziah's name? Yeah, sorry. This is not very sorry. kind. Sorry. I'm going to start over. You messed me up. Okay. In the year that King Uzziah died... Connor? Keep going. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Mm. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So here we have in this passage, we have the prophet Isaiah. He, he, he's, he's in this vision. He, he's got this this is what's called a theophany, this, this manifestation of God that, he, that he's standing before. This is in the same year that King Uzziah died. And, he, and Isaiah's in this vision, and he sees God uh, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe is filling the whole temple. And there's smoke all around, and there's seraphim flying around. And these seraphim, they're, they're angels. And these angels... They have six wings, and they they have one 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 pair of wings to cover their eyes, and 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 one pair of wings to cover their feet, and one pair to fly. Why do you, why do you think, Connor? Why do you think they have the seraphim have all these wings? Um. Well, they're using them to cover things. They are. And Isaiah, if he saw all of the holiness in full. He probably just dropped dead. Yeah, absolutely. The seraphim are creatures, right? They're, they're God's creation. God God created the seraphim. And so even the seraphim, in the presence of God, cannot behold his presence. They have to cover their eyes, and they have to cover their feet, because they are standing in the presence of God. And that tells us something about God's presence and his holiness and that is it is so pure for mere creatures that we cannot we cannot uh, we cannot even bear it this is too much because he's so pure and we're just creatures and so the seraphim they're they're flying around and one says to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So when the seraphim say holy, what, what, what is so special about how they say it? That they say it multiple times. Now, why, why would they say that multiple times? Well, we know any time in the Bible when something's repeated, that it's saying... You need to pay attention. If it's repeated three times, then it's really serious. But we do see this often used in their language. It's kind of like, hey, pay attention. 
this is important. Yeah, so like like in the English language or how our culture writes, if we want to emphasize something, we we bold print it or we underline it or we italicize it. And there's many other tools that you could use. Um, but in their culture back then, they, they used repetition. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Nowhere in scripture do you see God is love, love, love. Right? I don't see that. And neither does it say uh, God is wrath, wrath, wrath. The most important attribute that we could understand about God is that God is holy, holy, holy. Because from his holiness flows everything else, including his wrath. Moving forward, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And so, not only were the creatures affected by God's holiness, but the whole temple was, was filled with his holiness. And, and the temple was shaken, and smoke filled it. And again, that puts emphasis on the grandness and the glory of God. And it all shook. And this brought a reaction to Isaiah. And what was Isaiah's reaction to all of this? He said, woe is me. What what is woe is what does that even mean? Um and basically he he thought he was gonna die. Why why did he think he was gonna die? I don't know, Ryan. Why did he think he was gonna die? Well, we understand that God is holy and and his holiness basically means he's he's so pure and, and we we were discussing like he's too pure for us to handle. So let's talk about us. What does the Bible say about us? That our hearts are deceitful and that we're all sinners. That our hearts are deceitful and we're all sinners. Let, let, me, let me read you a verse here. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Let me read for you Romans Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. It is written, No one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Jumping down, there is no fear of God before their eyes. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This says that we can't even understand the things of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1-3 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, all of us, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind that's who we were that's who humanity is we are children of wrath we deserve god's wrath because of his holiness god is so pure and we are so not and so when we are exposed to god's holiness we cry out like isaiah did woe is me for i am lost for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was terrified because he saw God's holiness. And when he was exposed to God's holiness, he saw his own sinfulness. And he understood 
before this God, what do I deserve? I deserve death. Hmm. And that's for all of us. So when we look at these stories, Ananias and Sapphira, they weren't innocent people. They, what did they deserve? They deserved exactly what God gave them. And we look at the story of the two sons of Aaron who, who gave up unauthorized fire before the Lord. What did they deserve? What God gave them. What God gave them. There, there's a story. I won't read the story. But there's a story in First Chronicles chapter 13 where the, the Israelites... They, they kept their, the Ark of the Covenant in storage. And the Ark of the Covenant was a big box that held the, the Ten Commandments. And it represented God's presence on earth. And so if you read in Numbers chapter 4, there are very specific instructions given to Aaron's sons who took care of the Ark to not touch the ark because if you touch the ark you will surely die because that represents the very presence of God on earth and so in 1st Chronicles chapter 13 the ark is in storage and the Israelites and David King David are like hey we want to take it out of storage we want to set it up so we could you know we could glorify God through it and so they go grab the ark they put it on it on a a cart uh, pulled by oxen and they parade down back to their their headquarters I don't know I can't remember where they're going but probably Jerusalem and so they're parading down the parading down the trail and all of a sudden one of the ox stumbles and as the ox stumbles the Ark of the Covenant slips and is heading towards the ground and one of the men who is in charge of looking after the ark as they're parading down, as he looked at the ark and saw it slipped, he reached out to touch it and to hold it still. And what happened to this man? He died. He did die. And why did he die? Because they weren't supposed to touch the ark of the covenant. Because it represented... Yeah, they weren't supposed to touch the Ark of the Covenant because represented it God's presence. God's presence before them. And this man... Just like an Indiana Jones in the Raiders oh, of the Lost yeah, Ark. Absolutely, just like an Indiana Jones. Oh, melt. And so Jonathan Edwards, in, in, in talking about this passage, uh, he said that the sin of this man... You see, all of us, if we at first glance we read this passage, we think that man was a hero because he kept the Ark from touching the dirty ground and so why he's an innocent man he's trying to help God out and why would God strike him down but Jonathan Edwards said the sin of this man was that he assumed that his hand was cleaner than the mud of the ground mm. that's savage yes that is savage Jonathan Edwards was a savage yeah you should go check him out so near in the hands of an angry God. That will make you feel very, very warm and fuzzy. <laughs> he assumed that his hand was cleaner than the mud of the ground, but we are sinful, and mud is not. Mud is just mud. Mud is just dirt and water combined. Mm. And so, so what if the Ark of the Covenant touches the mud, but if the Ark of the Covenant comes in contact with a hand of a sinner, then, bam. And see... So we see the sinfulness of us and the holiness of God. And so when we think about hell, you know, how, how does that make sense to us? We are sinning against a holy God, but an infinite God. You know, many people are like, why do we deserve hell? What have we ever done to God that, that, that elicits that kind of punishment and it's because we don't understand God and it is his infiniteness and when we sin against an infinite God that's the punishment that we that we have to pay is an infinite punishment wait Ryan 
Are you implying that we deserve hell because of our sins? Connor, that is exactly what I'm implying. Wait a minute. Are you implying that what Jesus did on the cross and the gift of forgiveness is undeserved? That is exactly what I am implying. But Ryan, don't you think that might offend people? I don't care if it offends people. Dang, you're as savage as Jonathan Edwards. Actually, I'm not as savage as Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> the point of my sarcasm is this. Is we we have this sort of entitled Christianity um, where we don't recognize the fact that God could have very well just sent all of us to hell if he wanted to, and he would have been justified in doing that. And that's where we see God's grace. And that's where we see God's mercy. And so I don't want to tell you all of this to make you think, wow, God is, is, is super scary and he actually is a bully and he actually is mean. Because in telling you all this, I want you to see the love of God hmm. and the grace of God and the mercy of God because God is so merciful to us. God is so gracious to us. We deserve his wrath. We deserve everything that, that he could pour out on us. Everything. But yet, what happens when we look to the Garden of Eden, God said, if you take from the tree and eat of that fruit, you will surely die. And when, Eve, when Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of that tree, yes, there was punishment, but Adam lived to be, what, 993 years? And God clothed them. God made a sacrifice for them so they could wear clothing. And God sent them out and... Adam and Eve had a family, and God made a promise in Genesis chapter 3 that there would be reconciliation through Jesus. Hmm. Even as far back as Genesis, we see Jesus. And we see mercy there, because God didn't kill them right away. And us, why, why does God have any good reason... Why, why do we have any good reason to wake up and take another breath every day? Why, why, why should God allow that? Why, why should I wake up and be alive? Hmm. I, there's no reason. God, God would be completely justified in striking me down right now. But in his mercy, he gives me breath. And he gives breath to every single person here on this earth that deserves his wrath. All 7.5 billion of us who mock him and hate him and and scorn him and, and just totally disobey him. And God gives us breath. And God gives us life when he could strike us all down. And God loves us so much that... He sent his son to die for us. And not only did God did, not only did Jesus die for us, Jesus bore our wrath. The wrath that God he bore God's wrath that we deserve. All of our sin, all of my sin, all of Connor's sin, our very nature, all of it, all, all of it is put on Jesus. And Jesus paid for all of that. Jesus bore the wrath that we deserved on the cross. And when I look at that, I see the reconciliation of God's wrath and God's love. In God's love, he bore his own wrath hmm. that we deserve. And it's interesting because you're sharing the gospel with somebody and they ask, well, how does the wrath and love of God come together? But truthfully, without both of those things, the gospel isn't necessary, nor does it make sense. If God is, if God is, has no wrath, then there's no reason for him to punish us. Or God wouldn't punish us, and so we wouldn't need the cross. But if God doesn't love us, then he wouldn't have sent his son to die for us. And it's necessary for both to be present. You're exactly right. So I think... Uh, what's interesting is that where this question really led was basically you just sharing the gospel, yet sharing parts of it that sometimes we gloss over because we focus 
so much on his love. Uh, but this is such an essential part of our understanding of the gospel that I think a lot of, uh, a lot of preaching maybe waters down a little bit. And uh, it's not something that should be watered down. No. It's something to take, uh, to take sensitively. We need to be sensitive to people who, who have not heard the gospel or, or maybe have only heard parts of it. And yes, you know, talking all about God's wrath can... Talking about God's wrath all the time can water down God's love. Mm. You know? When you talk all about God's wrath and you don't talk about God's love, then you're not getting the full picture of the gospel. If you talk all about God's love, but forget about talking about God's wrath, then you're forgetting a central part of the gospel as well. And so we need to be sensitive to people, but we also need to stand for the truth. And the truth is that we see God's wrath and God's love in the gospel, and we can't forget about that. No, we cannot. Well, Ryan, uh, thank you for bringing this topic this week. Connor, do you have any like last words to my to my friend in in, in evangelizing to to her friend, or any other idea thoughts about God and stuff? Anything? Well, I would just any time that you're you're talking to somebody who's essentially you're engaging in apologetics. Remember, remember that you can win the argument but lose the person. That's true. Uh, apologetics uh, is very personal in that you want to approach it differently with every individual that you encounter. You have to be sensitive to the person. You are making an emotional appeal as well as an intellectual appeal. Where I feel many people, uh, because we like to challenge ourselves... I treat it as merely an intellectual argument. There's a lot more at play than just logic. Right. Um, because many aspects of God are, are beyond human logic. Um, so yes, that's part of the discussion, but just be careful not to win the argument and lose the person in the process. Right. Yeah, we don't do apologetics to make us feel good about ourselves because we're smarter than everybody else and and we're not just trying to win the argument. We're trying to win souls here. Um, but also to remember that it's God who actually saves the soul. Yes, and uh, this is good because we do have a series on apologetics coming up before the year is over. Ooh. So and this conversation certainly not over. No, not at all. Hmm. Hmm. Any other thoughts from you, Ryan, to close? We had Chick-fil-A earlier today, and I like Chick-fil-A. I like Chick-fil-A, too. It's a good way to fuel up before a podcast. Oh, yeah. Actually, my mouth is kind of dry right now. I need to drink some of that sweet tea that's sitting on the desk. So, here we go. Um, Theology Thursday. Don't forget to email us questions you may have about Scripture or the Bible at theologythursdaypodcast at gmail.com or you can uh, shoot them to us at Twitter at theologytpod. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram. We also have a Facebook page now. You can listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Play Store, Apple Podcast, YouTube, Spotify, Podbean. We already mentioned Spotify. I know, but I use Spotify, so I like to Oh, uh, yeah. okay, yeah. Spotify is superior. Um, we're everywhere, man. So... Um, make make sure to, 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 to tell your friends. And we look forward to coming back and uh, talking a little more theology next Thursday.